So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, if you're joining us from different time zones. So welcome to the Pathia Colloquia of today. This is our target to early career scientists. Uh, so I will give now the, the forum to Hannah, who will introduce the two speakers of today. So enjoy. Hello, uh, I'm Ana Jimenez Gallardo. I'm a student here at ISO. And here today, with, together with Chiara Matsukeli, we're going to introduce the, the speakers for today. So, Chiara, if you want to introduce the first one. Sure. Thank you, Ana. So, for our first speaker, it's going to be Maria Jose Rain. And she's a PhD student at the University of Padua. Previously, she obtained her bachelor and her master degrees from the University of Concepcion in Chile, and she's an expert on stellar spectroscopy. Today, she's going to talk about Bruce Lackler's in open clusters. So I'm going to leave her to, uh, the room and uh, very happy to. Thank you. I will share my screen now. Uh, can, can you see it? Uh, yes, yes. And the presentation? It's coming up, yes. Okay, so thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak here today in this great colloquium series. And I'm looking forward to show you some of the work I've been doing during my PhD. My thesis is mainly focused on blue struggler stars in open clusters. Uh, this is stars play an important role in the complex interplay between stellar evolution and cluster dynamics. And by studying them, we can make large strides in improving our understanding of stellar evolution. So blue stragglers, at least some of you might never hear about them. So what are they? If we focus our attention in the figure, which is the color magnet diagram of the open cluster M67, it is apparent that not all the stars lie along the traditional expected path of stellar evolution, including the main sequence of giant branch and giant branch of the clusters. Uh, blue struggler stars are expected to be found in the blue region of the figure, and they are traditionally defined to be stars bluer and brighter than the main sequence to know of the cluster. The thing is that uh, these objects are not supposed to be there, given the age of the cluster, stars at the masses of the blue strugglers should have evolved to the red giant branch star a long time ago. So they are in some way struggling behind the, the expected evolution. But they are not the only unexpected population. Observations have shown another exotic population also exists, the yellow straggler stars, which are supposed to be blue stragglers evolving to the red giant branch. And all formation theories rely on the basis premise that blue stragglers are formed by adding mass to a main sequence star in some way. And in cluster environments, there are four main possible scenarios. One of the most accepted scenarios is the evolution of primordial binaries. In this scenario, the stragglers are formed via mass transfer or via merger. And the properties of the resulting star will depend on the nature of the donor. And here in the figure, I'm showing you an example of case B mass transfer, where six blue straggler stars in the globular cluster 47 tag, indicated with red symbols, were found to be depleted in carbon and oxygen, and meaning the progenitor accreted mass from a red giant star with an interior of CNO process material. Case C instead can lead to blue stragglers with enhanced baryon abundances, for example. Another way to make blue stragglers is via cosine lead of mechanisms. Hierarchical triple systems are stable configurations of a closed inner binary orbit by a third star at a much larger distance. And it is possible for the third star to induce eccentricity fluctuations in the inner binary and potentially causing the inner binary to merge through a process known as the eccentric cosine lead of mechanisms. And the effect is shown in the figure, which basically shows the separation in astronomical units of an inner binary over 
And after phases of cosine cycle, tidal friction, and magnetic breaking, the inner binary merges. And this merger will be observed as a blue struggler in a binary. Uh, however, these triple systems are not very common, and detecting them via radial velocity method is extremely difficult. And without a strong observational constraints on triple system clusters, almost all the information we manage regarding these mechanisms rely on theoretical efforts. Uh, the thing is, we definitely need another star to make a blue stragglers. And that can happen uh, with the transfer of material, but you can also have a single star or a binary system in a star cluster that goes through dynamical encounter and then collide with another star. And there are many possibilities on how this can happen. And here in the video, I'm showing you just an example to give you an idea on how complex these systems are. Uh, I will go back so you can see the video. Here we have a triple star in the space. The dots are the stars and the line are some kind of trail that show you where they are. And this system is encountering a binary star. And we can see also how one of the stars from the triple system is ejected. And most interesting is that we can see how blue stragglers form from the collision of the inner binary system of the original triple system, given the influence of the other stars. I have mentioned here that the, this very different formation mechanisms can result in a stellar product that is defined as a blue struggler. And therefore, the definition of a blue struggler is not physical, but empirical. And any star falling above the main sequence soon of a cluster CMD will be counted as a blue struggler, regardless of the mechanisms responsible for creating that object. Okay, but where we can find these kind of stars? And the answer is almost everywhere, in all kinds of stellar environments, in the field, in open, in globular clusters, and even in galaxies of the local group. Uh, several years ago, an, an universal anti-correlation between the normalized number of blue stragglers and the integrated magnitude was found in galaxy open clusters, globular clusters and dwarf galaxies. Uh, this anti-correlation basically shows that regardless of the specific complexity and origin, uh, more massive objects are blue stragglers efficient, uh, placing open clusters as preferential systems to host blue straggler stars. Uh, a few catalogs of blue stragglers in open clusters are available. Uh, the latest and the most comprehensive was published almost 14 years ago. While these catalogs are useful, the main disadvantage they have is the lack of reliable membership information, and they are not reliable enough to allow the revision of statistical properties of blue stragglers. And the main problem they have is the contamination coming from field stars that usually tend to occupy the very same region uh, as the stragglers in the CND, artificially enhancing the population. So between uh, the principal aims of this catalog is first, uh, to move towards a more comprehensive picture of the nature and origin of these stars by improving the membership driving blue struggle statistics. But also is to identify what type of clusters have blue stragglers, what type do not have, investigate possible relation with the mass, age, metallicity, etc. And in general is to provide to the community with uh, an homogeneous and internally consistent catalog. So the main problem of the previous catalogs are the lack of homogeneity of the open cluster data available at the time they were published, and that the strugglers candidates are mostly of an uncertain membership. And today, an improvement in the selection of the strugglers has become possible thanks to the latest data release on Gaia mission. This survey has made the kinematic method of our membership determination more reliable. And by combining the parallax measurements with the proper motions and the color of the star, it is now possible to establish membership with higher accuracy and thereby identify the blue strugglers. So in this catalog, how do we identify them? So we needed a large uh, catalog with a great number of open clusters. And for that reason, we made use of Cantat Gaudin catalog. They have derived membership in more than 1,800 open clusters by using the unsupervised clustering of proper motions and parallax on Gaia DR2 data. 
And in order to deal with a sample of clusters very similar to those in the previous catalogs, from the original list of, uh, of Mother La Passette, we have extracted around 400 clusters available in Cantatauri. And the data of every cluster was plotted on the color magnitude diagram, and an approximate matching of a parsec isochron uh, was fit with the Gaia pass bands on the main sequence and to NOF, and eventually on the red Ryan branch and red clump if present. Uh, we also plot the equal mass binary sequence and the zero H main sequence. The binary sequence especially to constrain the region expected to be populated by binaries made of normal main sequence full of the stars, but it also helps to constrain the blue hook region. We decided also to search uh, yellow straggler stars. These are the objects with colors between those of the turn off and red giant branch, but brighter than the subgiant branch. And uh, as, as Told, these stars can keep memory of the formation mechanisms, offering an alternative way to understand the blue straggler origin. And we believe that the systematic search of these uh, yellow stragglers opens the possibility to determine their chemical and kinematic properties. Uh, the region in which these stars uh, were searched is plotted on yellow, and it's approximately limited to the left by the cluster to north, and below and to the right by the binary sequence. Uh, we were extra careful selecting these stars since in open clusters, the yellow struggles regime can also contain binaries and objects formed by two member stars. And the combined light of these stars photometrically plays the system within this region. Uh, however, this, uh, these stars, yellow and blue strugglers, are still candidates. And the final proof of membership requires radio velocity measurements. So let's see some of the results we found. Uh, the comparison between this new catalog and Aumada La Passette, which is the previous one, was possible only for sources with right ascension and declination information available. And this is another improvement from the previous versions. In this new catalog, the position of the stars and also the astrometric uh, solution is uh, there. So we found large inconsistencies First, uh, for uh, individual clusters, the percentage of blue stragglers found to be a non-member according with our criteria, it's between 10 and 60% uh, of the Omada and La Basset catalog. And of course, we are aware that some blue stragglers are lost, given the conservative selection criteria we use, and also the limitations of this catalog, which are basically the limitations of Kaya. And the histogram shows you and gives you an idea of how striking is the difference on white are the number of clusters we found to host at least one blue stragglers, on Cyan the clusters of uh, Aumada 2007, and on Magenta uh, the clusters of Aumada in uh, 1995. So uh, to the right of the histogram, there are two color magnitude diagrams for two clusters. Yellow dots are cantatobic members, blue circles are uh, our selection of uh, blue stragglers, and white open circles uh, are those of Aumada uh, in La Paz 2007. And in the case of Colinder 261, only seven stars are in common. And in NGC 2477, something really interesting happened. All the blue stragglers selected by Amada and La Passette are indeed members, but they are mostly clustered around the turn off and subgiant branch of the cluster. So this is the galactic distribution of all the clusters. Uh, in yellow, all cantatobi members uh, on open white circles, the clusters we analyzed in this catalog, and on color, the clusters on which we found blue stragglers. Uh, in total, we found 900 blue stragglers, and from the 408 clusters we study, only 111 have at least one blue straggler. This is 20% of the total sample, and it's about one third less than found in previous catalogs. And so I guess we can safely assume that a good part of these results comes from the great improvement membership information available for the present work because of Kaya. So here I'm showing you exactly the same, but for yellow struggler stars. In total, we found 77 candidates in 43 clusters. This is around one yellow struggler per 11 blue strugglers and represent a percentage of 11% of the cluster. And most of them have only one yellow struggler. 
And I cannot give you a comparison here because this uh, is the first ever report catalog of this uh, kind of stars in open cluster. So these are the combined color magnitude diagrams corrected for distance and extinction. The figure on the left is for blue stragglers and the figure of the right is for yellow candidates. Uh, the color here indicates the age of the cluster. The number of stragglers we found in clusters with ages lower than one giga year is relatively low, no more than five stars. And around 70% of the blue stragglers are in uh, clusters older than two giga years. And regarding the yellow stragglers, uh, they start to appear in significantly older clusters, and 55% of them are in clusters older than two giga years. Okay, so one of the scopes of this work was to confirm the suggested relation with clusters parameters such as age and metallicity or mass from the previous catalogs. And the figure shows the normalized rate of blue star as a function of the cluster age. We have also reported the tool of mass. And uh, not all the 400 clusters of the catalog are plot, only the ones with well-defined evolutionary uh, phase signatures and good statistics. Uh, the radio is ratio is approximately constant for young open clusters until 500 megajoules more or less, which corresponds to a turnoff of mass of 2.4 solar masses. And then it's followed by a steep increase for other clusters. In the previous catalog, the absolute number of stragglers grows with the cluster age starting from three mega years. And the truth is that we don't expect stragglers in clusters with these ages so young. So by cross-correlating our list of clusters with the recently published catalog of DIAS, uh, they provide clusters parameters as, such as ages, extinction, and distances for a large number of clusters and using Gaia. So we found a sort of, a sort of anti-correlation between the normalized number of loose stragglers and the photometric metallicity of the cluster. To test how strong the correlation is, we have uh, performed a experiment correlation test. The values are reported on the upper part of the figure. And the test gives a experiment coefficient of around minus 0.4. And it is also risky to jump to the conclusion that the number of blue stragglers is correlated with the metallicity, because we know the metallicity is one of the most difficult parameters to measure using photometry. And to confirm this anticorrelation, we need the spectroscopic metallicities for sure. Uh, something interesting we notice is the three clusters that do not follow the trend. They are the oldest and between the less populated. Uh, here I have plot the number of loose travels as a function of the mass. Uh, we have also performed a experiment rank correlation test and we got a value of 0 0.55 and a 2% of probability this correlation is occurring by chance. Uh, these results indicate that blue straggler uh, numbers and clusters masses are correlated in open clusters. And additionally, we have a fit a power law, and we found a value of gamma equal to 0 0.63, which is a bit higher than the value predicted by night uh, 2009 for globular clusters. This behavior, however, was predicted in a certain way by late 2011, and it's related with the blue stragglers that form in the outskirts of massive clusters who have not had sufficient time to migrate via dynamical friction to the cluster center and consequently lowering the value of the index gamma in the power law they found. And here we are comparing the global parameters. And this means the total mass and the total number of stragglers in the whole extension of the cluster, not only in the center. Okay, so maybe you remember this figure from the beginning of the talk. One of the main questions we wanted to address with this catalog was if open clusters are or not favorable environments for uh, blue struggler stars. And the answer is not anymore. When plotting the blue struggler specific frequency, the figure shows two general trends. Open clusters follow a distribution similar to the distribution of the globular clusters. They have similar frequencies, but at different luminosities. And the distribution of open clusters seems to be split in two groups, one that exactly follow the globular cluster distribution, and another one that significantly detached towards lower specific frequencies. 
But uh, we wanted to go a little bit further, and we had the spectroscopy data for the stratum population of four clusters. And using high resolution spectra from flames spectrograph, we calculate the radial velocities of each star and compare it with the cluster mean. And for each cluster, we have between four and eight epochs, and we classify them using a very rough classification, assuming blue stragglers are the result of collision or that they are in binary systems. And in total, we found 10 uh, closed binary system, one long period binary, three blue stragglers uh, being non-member, and seven non-variable. And between these non-variable, one yellow straggler. So the figures shows the velocity distribution of the blue stragglers in the old open cluster calling the 261. By looking at this distribution, it's very easy to separate between short and long period binaries following uh, our classification. And the line at the center indicates the cluster mean radial velocity. And the two touch lines are the limit of 20 kilometers per second that separates between long and short period binaries. As I mentioned previously, our list of candidates are very different from those of Almada. As a consequence of this, the struggle population in the four cluster were not completely observed because of the list of Almada was used in the time proposal. Even with a small quantity of data, we found interesting results and the spectrum Velocities also allow us to obtain measurements of the projected rotational velocities. And for this cluster in particular, we found five close binary systems, all fast rotators. And for three of them, we calculate the masses of the secondary component. To fit the orbits, we use the periods reported in the literature and uh, our radar velocity measurements. Uh, we estimate the masses of the primaries by orthogonally projecting isochrons, and we found values between 0.1 to 0.4 solar masses. We found also one long period binary, and in contrast, we found uh, four stragglers with constant radial velocities, but they are all slow rotators, and among them, one yellow straggler. So according with our catalog, this cluster has the second largest uh, blue struggle population. And by cross-matching our catalog with tests, we found that 40% of the strugglers equal in the 261 are in short period binaries uh, with orbital periods between five hours and three days. And these results represent a surprise because they are in contrast with the results found by other authors in NGC 188 and MC. Which are two of the most very well studied open clusters, and where most of the stragglers are found to have orbital period uh, of 1000 days. So, in fact, calling the 261, it's uh, much older, and these two clusters. Um, and this uh, large fraction of very short period binaries we found may tell us important facts about the relative importance of the various blue struggle formation mechanisms as a function of age of the cluster, and maybe provide a link between young open clusters and globulars that we know are much older than open clusters. But of course, that we need the radar velocities in order to calculate the orbital solution and the system velocity and confirm the membership of the stragglers candidates. So here's my summary. Uh, we are providing to the scientific community with a new and homogeneous catalog of blue stragglers. This is also the first catalog of the blue, uh, blue straggler stars I and mean yellow stragglers. And in general, we found uh, around 900 blue stragglers and 77 yellow stragglers. We have proved open clusters are not preferential system to host blue stragglers anymore. And we have confirmed the number of stragglers increase with the age and mass, and we also found some hints of a possible anti-correlation with the metallicity. Finally, we have provided a fierce spectroscopic analysis of the blue struggles population in four open clusters, where different types of binaries were identified. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very nice talk. Are there any questions? Okay, I see that Paula has a question. Please go ahead. Ah, uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I, it might be a naive question, but I have not uh, uh, caught the, the relevance of blue stragglers for the study of stellar evolution. 
uh, why are they so important? Okay, I understand their binary system, which are very uh, interesting to follow up. But, and I know I understood the position on the HR diagram, but uh, what are the other interesting yes. clues that we can get from uh, for stellar evolution? From them? Okay, yes, the thing is that uh, by using the single stellar evolution theory, we all know, uh, there are uh, 26 percent, I think, of uh, stars that that not well reproduce. Uh, so the idea of understand the the blue stragglers, it's to include them in the models. It's uh, to be able to reproduce them in the models, so we can be more accurate at the hour of, uh, of reproduce uh, these populations. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you all. I think we have another question from Dietrich. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, blue stragglers have been for, for decades, as you said, one of the most mysterious things in, in stellar evolution theory. And so I think it's very good that this work is finally done. Congratulations on the results. Um, are there any B? stars among the blue stragglers uh, that you have found? B stars with emission lines? No, I don't know, but I'm aware that there is a person that is working on that. Uh, he's searching chemically weird stars between our sample of blue stragglers. So if I have more information, I will send it. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Maybe in the meantime, while we wait for other potential questions, I have a question. Uh, again, not from the field, but uh, could you maybe spend a few words in saying what's the relation between the yellow stragglers and blue stragglers? And if you find, if there's any, and uh, if you find, uh, or if it's interesting at all to find these two type of uh, stragglers in the same clusters. Okay, so it's supposed that yellow straggler stars are the blue stragglers, but uh, that they are evolving to the to the red giant branch. And uh, until now, there was a no, uh, let's say, a systematic search of the yellow straggler stars in clusters. They were only individual uh, works, let's say. Uh, and they have uh, found that uh, in some yellow stragglers, you can actually uh, infer that they come from a, a star that has uh, similar properties than the blue stragglers stars. And they, they also infer if uh, that star went through a mass transfer, for example, uh, or collision. So I think it's uh, really important that we are providing this catalog to the community with these kind of stars. But we know that uh, for sure some of them uh, are systematics. We are not saying that these stars are all uh, yellow, real yellow star stars. Thank you, Marianne. Again, very, very nice work. Um, as I don't see any other um, raised hands in Zoom or question on YouTube, mm -hmm. I would uh, give the word to Anna to present uh, Antonio, okay. our next uh, speaker. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay, so for our next speaker, we have Antonio Pensabene, who is uh, currently a PhD student for the INAF, sorry observatory in Bologna and also for the University of Bologna. Antonio also obtained his, PhD, his master's and bachelor's degree from the University of Florence, and he's currently working on quasars at high redshift. So, Antonio, whenever you want. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can you see the slide? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. So, um, first of all, I would like to thank all the organizers for giving me the opportunity of uh, presenting my work in this very nice setting. Uh, and uh, as I told Anna, uh, I'm Antonio Pensabene, uh, a third year PhD student in, uh, in Astrophysics and Space Science Observatory and University of Bologna. 
under the supervision of uh, Dr. Roberto De Carli. And my PhD thesis focused on uh, characterization of Quasaros galaxies at redshift greater than six uh, through uh, some millimeter observations. And today uh, I'm going to present to you uh, an ALMA multiline study of the interstellar medium in two systems at redshift greater than six, composed by uh, Quasar and the companion galaxy in the close uh, in, the, in the proximity of, uh, of the Quasar. At the bottom of, of these slides, you can see uh, high angular resolution uh, C plus uh, observation in which you can clearly uh, locate the position of uh, the quasars and the companion galaxy. Uh, namely, these two systems are PJ38 minus 21, a redshift uh, about 6.2, and PJ231 minus 20, a redshift roughly 6.5. As you can see here in one of our system, you can also, uh, you can also see that there is interaction between uh, a companion galaxy and, uh, and quasar host, and you can see tidal stripping. Okay. Uh, okay, this story uh, began with the serendipitous discovery of uh, four companion galaxies uh, in, uh, the, in, in the ALMA field of uh, known quasars, as you can see in the uh, ALMA C plus observation and near infrared uh, at the top of this slide. And the very interesting aspects uh, of such systems are that uh, uh, the companion galaxies uh, do not show evidence of AGN activity unless they are uh, even obscured or intrinsically faint uh, AGN. Therefore, uh, study the ISM in these systems, uh, with, with, this, with this kind of uh, work, we have the opportunity to investigate uh, the impact of, uh, of uh, strong star formation and AGN activity on the ISM properties in these massive galaxies at Cosmic Dome. We also have uh, multi-wavelength uh, data um, observations for these uh, two systems, in particular from X-ray, in which Connor and collaborators uh, uh, basically uh, did not found any evidence of uh, X-ray emission from companion galaxies, and is uh, in the system's object of this work, thus suggesting that uh, these uh, uh, companion galaxies uh, do not host a uh, powerful AGN. If you want to study uh, the interstellar medium, uh, we have uh, first to keep in mind that uh, ISM is a very complex environment exposed to, to a variety of uh, physical conditions. Therefore, uh, we need uh, to target uh, uh, a key suit diagnostics associated to uh, different phases of ISM in order to dissect the properties of such complex environments. For these reasons, I started from already collected ALMA cycle 3, 5, and 7, uh, and 7 observation targeting uh, 11 main emission diagnostics, including N+, C+, C1, multiple CO lines, H2O transitions, OH doublet, and of course, a uh, far infrared continuum. Okay, uh, I'm going to briefly present you all the different detection uh, that we have, starting from uh, PJ23, 1, minus 20. On the left, you can see uh, spectra, including continuum emission, while on the right, you can see uh, continuum subtracted uh, line maps. Um, here you can see that we have uh, N plus detection in both the Quasar and Companion Galaxy in this system. N plus is associated to a uh, fully ionized medium. We also have uh, uh, CO726 and C1 that are associated respectively to a molecular and atomic phase of ISM. Also, uh, interestingly, we have uh, a IJ CO detection in Quasar host uh, uh, galaxy of this system, while we do not detect uh, a very IJ transition in, uh, in, uh, in the companion galaxy. Uh, the IJ transition are associated to uh, high temperature or, uh, and or high density medium. Therefore, uh, this is a first evidence of uh, a less excited medium in the companion galaxy of this system with respect to the Quasar host. Additionally, we detected uh, um, three H2O uh, lines in the Quasar host uh, galaxy that uh, is associated to a warm dense phase 
of the ISM or shocked medium uh, um, by AGN driven outflow. And finally, uh, you can also see in this slide a uh, nice OH tablet detection in both Quasar host and companion galaxy that likely trace similar region as traced by water vapor emissions. For the other system, uh, PJ38-21, unfortunately, we only have uh, sparse detections uh, due to the fact that uh, the ALMA program was uh, not completed. So uh, we ended up only with uh, two frequency setup for this system. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, the following results that I'm going to show you uh, are mainly focused on uh, the first system. Here you can see uh, also the dust continuum maps in four frequency and two frequency setup for this last system. Okay, I started by combining uh, continuum data in order to uh, retrieve information on uh, dust properties. Uh, here you can see data points for the Quasar host in red and companion galaxy in blue for PJ231-20. Um, I use these data points uh, to uh, perform uh, modeling using a standard modified black body uh, function. I also included the, the effect of the CMB that is uh, an important source of heating and a strobe ground against which we measure uh, the emission of such high redshift. And uh, to do so, uh, we need to impose a prior on dust temperature because uh, basically due to the lack of data point near to the peak of the dust CD. We first consider uh, a, a standard scenario with a, um, a dust temperature, uh, a prior on dust temperature centered around 47K. That is a typical dust temperature measured in high redshift uh, uh, Quasarox galaxies. Uh, while for uh, the companion galaxy, we also considered an additional scenario with a lower dust temperature of 35K in order to take into account that uh, dust could be less heated in that system. And uh, with this kind of, a, with, a, with a bias and approach, uh, I retrieved the estimate of uh, dust masses and spectral emissivity index uh, in these, uh, in these uh, two uh, galaxies. For the other system, PJ38-21, you can see that uh, constraints on dust parameters are shallower due to the lack of data point, essentially. Okay, uh, we now want to uh, put quantitative constraints on uh, different ISM phases. Uh, to do so, we need uh, a model in order to obtain prediction of line intensities uh, emerging from uh, different phases uh, of the ISM. Um, therefore, we employed Cloudy Radiative Transfer Code, and within Cloudy, we set up um, a standard experiment of uh, photo uh, dissociation and X-ray dominated region. Um, therefore, we, uh, we, we the experiment uh, um, was set up with a, a molecular cloud exposed to a radiation field from a young star, a black body at a temperature of 10 to the 4K for the PDR and a standard AG at the plate for the, for the XDR. Uh, we can also include in this experiment, uh, of course, the effect of CMB as a redshift six, properties of ISM grains, cosmic rays, turbulence, and so on. And um, basically, Cloudy uh, solves the relative transfer equations across uh, a one dimensional plane parallel slab of ISM and predicts uh, the line intensities emerging from the outskirts of a molecular cloud. With these uh, predictions, we can now um, compare our observations uh, with the model in order to put constraints on ISM properties. In this case, I started with the C plus over C1 ratio, that is a powerful tool in order to uh, distinguish be between PDR regime, therefore star formation, and uh, XDR case, uh, mainly powered by uh, AGN activity. As you can see on the left, uh, the PDR case, the, in the gray lines are counter plot as a function of two main parameters, the uh, hydrogen density of the cloud and the strength of radiation field in unit of the ebb in flux, G0. And the color, the shaded um, yellow area is the C plus over uh, C1 ratio, ratio measured in PJ23, uh, one minus 20 uh, quasar. 
As you can see, we obtain a range uh, for these two parameters. And when we combine um, the ratio between C1 over total inferred luminosity and C plus over total inferred luminosity, we can put uh, a tiger constraint on the intensity of uh, uh, interstellar radiation field in this, uh, in this source. Um, Cloudy uh, also tell us that uh, XDR case cannot reproduce our observation, therefore, uh, the, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the C plus over C1 ratio, the bulk of such emissions uh, mainly arise uh, uh, in environment exposed to the star formation activity. We can also uh, retrieve uh, other information uh, by using a C plus and plus uh, and uh, N plus emission. Here we uh, estimate the fraction of C plus arising from the neutral medium, therefore the PDR. We know that uh, C plus is uh, has a slightly um, lower ionization of potential with respect to hydrogen atom, therefore it traces both uh, the ionized and uh, neutral phase, while N plus has a similar ionization of potential of C plus and also similar critical density, but uh, it traces uh, a fully ionized medium. Uh, therefore, by assuming a typical uh, C plus over N plus ratio of three, there's a typical uh, ratio observed in H2 region. By using our observed N plus, we can estimate uh, uh, the fraction of C plus arising from the ionized medium that we can then subtract to the observed C plus emission in order to estimate the fraction of C plus arising from the neutral medium. Our results uh, suggest that uh, the neutral medium can account for almost all C plus emission in both Quasar and Companion galaxy. In particular, we compare our result with a sample of a local infrared luminous uh, galaxy. As you can see, uh, one of our, of our Quasar of our sorry companion galaxy in the low temperature case um, uh, le, uh, lie, lies in um, in the between the population of uh, warm local luminous infrared galaxy while the quasar host uh, are in a, in a range of higher dust temperature but uh, with a large fraction of c plus arising from pdr namely greater than 80 percent we can also combine uh, multiple CO uh, line detection in, uh, in all galaxies in order to study the uh, energetics of ISM. Uh, here you can see <coughs> the CO sled, that is uh, basically the luminosity of CO line um, normalized to one transition um, as a function of uh, uh, the uh, rotational quantum number. Uh, and we compare our CO sled with uh, those of average uh, local star bus galaxy and AGN. And also you can see the tail CO sled of the Milky Way, uh, those of uh, aspects uh, Alma large program in different redshift red bins, and also other uh, detailed uh, CO sled of uh, redshift, uh, other high redshift quasars. One of our quasars, namely the same, the PGA 231 minus 20, uh, appear uh, consistent with the uh, uh, CO sled of local AGN and other shift quasar, while uh, um, the CO sled of companion galaxy uh, appear less excited, uh, as in the case of star of local star bust, uh, in which CO sled reach a peak around J equal six and seven, then slightly decrease uh, at, uh, at higher J uh, at variance of uh, AGN average sled that uh, basically stays flat up to very high uh, J. And this, uh, uh, again, uh, this is uh, evidence of a less excited medium in uh, Quasar in Companion Galaxy with respect to Quasar host in, uh, in one of our system. Here you can see uh, CO sled predictions from Cloudy and uh, the, expect the, the, the very difference here is, is on the IJ uh, CO line. In PDR case, uh, appear less excited than in XDR case uh, as, uh, as uh, we expect from other results uh, from literature. And we used uh, such models in order to perform fit of uh, um, one of our CO sled, uh, that of uh, the quasar PJ231-20, that is the only one that uh, allow us to perform such approach. I employed a composite model of a PDR plus XDR, and our best, best fit model um, basically tells us that uh, the PDR dominates uh, uh, the molecular mass 
and the luminosity of CO lines up to J equals six, uh, seven, while XDR uh, has a minor contribution to the molecular mass, uh, but dominates uh, the emission at um, uh, J greater than, uh, than 10. And basically we can, uh, uh, we can figure out a scenario in which uh, low J CO line arise from, uh, um, from medium that lies in the galaxy disk, while uh, uh, IJ CO line uh, arise from a more compact central region near, uh, near the AGN. We also studied uh, the warm dense phase of ISM uh, through H2O transitions. Uh, at the top, you can see cloudy prediction of uh, for H2O uh, sleds that in this case uh, is the luminosity of H2O line normalized to the luminosity of one transition as a function of the energy of the upper level. Here is most difficult to figure out the excitation of, uh, of the ISM by looking at, uh, at these plots because H2O uh, uh, is, a, is a very complicated uh, level structure and uh, also the energetics uh, because low J H2O lines um, are mainly collisionally excited in the warm dense medium while uh, IJ H2 lines uh, uh, are, are uh, instead excited through absorption of uh, uh, far infrared photons uh, uh, re-emitted by dust uh, through uh, the so-called uh, radiative pumping uh, mechanisms. So it's not so easy to understand uh, with, um, uh, how, uh, how much the medium is excited by looking to this plot. But we can use uh, such models in order to perform uh, um, modeling of, the, of our observed H2O sled, as you can see in the lower right corner of this slide. And our model um, basically point to um, high density medium exposed to a strong interstellar radiation field with a hydrogen column density of the order of 10 to 24 centimeters to the minus two, we, that corresponds uh, uh, roughly to an H2O column density greater than 10 to the 17 uh, centimeters to the minus two. We also studied the uh, correlations between uh, H2O luminosity and total infrared luminosity. Uh, that uh, were pre previously studied by different authors, in particular uh, Chen Tao Yang in 2013 um, and 2016, and also uh, collaborators. And uh, uh, such correlations are important um, in order to um, basically study uh, the, uh, the nature of this correlation, tell us uh, how the, uh, the radiation pumping is important. Uh, uh, in driving uh, this, uh, uh, this correlation. In particular, uh, low, uh, correlation for low JH2 line appear uh, consistent with linear relation that, uh, um, that basically uh, tell us that uh, um, H2O luminosity is straight for a low JH2 line, is tracing the strap formation rate uh, as in the case of uh, CO lines or other dense tracers, for example, ACN while uh, IJ H2 lines uh, correlations uh, appear slightly super linear. And this is uh, likely the imprinting of the radiation pumping in, this, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in driving this correlation. As you can see here, one of our questions almost lies perfectly on this, uh, on this correlation. And we also studied the ratio between H2 luminosity and total infrared luminosity. And we found uh, no difference uh, in this ratio uh, with respect to uh, the, me the measured uh, ratio in uh, um, star forming dominated uh, galaxy and AGN in local universe. Therefore suggesting that uh, uh, H2O lines could be uh, indeed, uh, um, uh, can be excited by uh, star formation basically. We can also uh, finally study uh, the ratio between H2O lines and OH that likely trace a similar medium. And uh, we found a self consistent result, basically uh, a dense medium exposed to, to stronger radiation field. Okay, uh, I can now uh, put you on my summary. 
and uh, uh, I show you that uh, we can uh, do a, um, a variety of a large variety of, um, of analysis by targeting uh, different phi structure and molecular uh, lines, uh, even at such high redshift uh, with ALMA, in order to inspect uh, the um, the ISM properties in these massive galaxies emerging at cosmic dawn. I show you that uh, ISM in, uh, uh, in one of our Quesaros galaxy appear highly excited at variance of uh, the ISM in uh, companion galaxies. And this is uh, likely the result of the AGN activity. And we can also put uh, order of magnitude constraint on ISM physical properties in these primordial galaxies by employing a very simple uh, uh, radiative transfer model by using uh, only few free parameters. And uh, that's it, and uh, I have to take questions. Thank you very much, Antonio. A really nice talk. So I see that Paola already has a question, so go ahead, Paola. Yeah, I'm, I think you should be very careful to derive parameters from the PDR models when you use the models only with their two lines. I wonder why you no, don't do a fit with all the CO sleds and their atomic carbon and the C plus together. Okay. You will get the constraints, you will break some ge degeneracy. I think anyway that the PDR model don't work in this in this kind of environments, but uh, it's what we have at the moment. Yeah, uh, basically, if you look at, I can, sorry, because I cannot go, uh, sorry, I try to share again my screen because I cannot uh, go to the previous slides, I don't know why. Um, okay. Okay. That's good. So, um, so here, for example, uh, we did not, uh, we have not done a fit. This is a, just a comparison between more prediction from cloudy models and observations. While with the CO line, we perform, uh, we perform a fit. Basically, but I understand your question. Um, be, be, uh, I don't know. I have to think about it. This uh, could be uh, a possibility to perform uh, simultaneously fit of uh, this line ratio and also uh, CO sleds. But, but maybe we need uh, more line. I don't know. Uh, okay, yes, but uh, also we need to keep in mind that uh, um, C plus and C one basically trace star formation while uh, in uh, CO sleds, uh, we have uh, the contribution from PDR and also XDR. I'm not so sure because the CO lines, the low J CO lines, they are very highly affected by the CMB. So you don't you don't have the entire flux uh, at low frequency. But anyway, <laughs> we may yeah. we may talk offline if you are interested. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice talk. Anyway. Thanks. Okay, so any more questions So for now? Okay, so while we wait, maybe I can ask you, because I'm not an expert on this topic, so can you comment a little bit on the any approximations of assumptions that you may have taken when applying the ionization models like yeah. that could impact your work? Yeah, okay. Um... One of the main approximation that we, uh, we have to do when we, we compare model predictions with observation is uh, basically the single cloud uh, model. Uh, if you look uh, at, the, at the data, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't have information. Uh, we don't have uh, um, the data, the, the galaxies are spatially unresolved, basically. So we have all the information within, uh, within the ALMA beam. So we don't know anything about uh, geometry or about, uh, um, I don't know, gradients of uh, different uh, line emission across, uh, across the galaxy dimensions. So what we can do is basically uh, approximate the galaxy with a single cloud and use uh, uh, the line ratio in order to um, mitigate the large uncertainties uh, on unknown parameter. 
And this is uh, basically one of the big uh, limitation of, of such approach. Maybe in the future uh, we can uh, follow up with uh, high spatial resolution data in order to see if uh, basically the, the gradients of the different diagnostics across uh, the galaxy dimension and try to uh, perform a multi-phase ISM modeling uh, with, uh, I don't know, for example, a hotter phase near, the, near the, to the IGN and a colder one uh, through the, the rest of the galaxy disk. Okay, thank you. I don't see any more questions, I don't know. So, oh, it seems that- Maybe I have another one, yeah. if I may. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have for more if, uh, data on towards uh, high redshift quasars you know, these frequencies? Uh, you mean for other kind of sources? Yes. Yeah, of course. Um, there are now in the literature a couple of works that uh, target uh, different quasars uh, galaxies, uh, uh, such high redshift, in particular redshift greater than six. As you can see, uh, work from Lee and collaborators, and also Novak and collaborators that perform multi multi line surveys of quasar host. We indeed use such data in order to compare our results with uh, with those from literature. But you're not uh, I'm not having observations on the pipeline, and I think uh, something approved and in in course to be observed. Yeah, you mean for other sources, uh, similar program in other sources? Yeah, uh, in, actually, we are working on uh, another project right now uh, that um, I can show you just a few slides. In particular, we are now focused on uh, H2O emission in, um, in a sample of uh, um, uh, infrared luminous quasars at HP greater than six. Uh, basically, there is uh, no much information on this uh, phase uh, as such high redshift, and uh, we want to we want to um, basically shed uh, a first light on this medium uh, um, at the end of the epoch of reionization. And we basically, yeah, we basically now I'm working on this project uh, with aim of um, understand the excitation mechanism of uh, H2O emission as such high redshift. Okay, very interesting. Yes, water line is uh, very cumbersome. To yeah, see. yeah, yeah. We, we also uh, additionally, uh, we are also trying to, uh, I don't know, find a way in order to inspect uh, in a more intuitively way, which is the excitation of it over H two O lines, because uh, as I previously mentioned. The uh, low JH2 lines are collisionally excited while uh, IJ uh, are uh, radiatively pumped. But uh, it's not uh, very easy to understand that variance of uh, CO sled in which you can clearly see which is the excitation from the trend of the CO sled. It's not so easy to do the similar things for, uh, for the H2 sleds because it's a very complicated. It's not uh, basically, we are not looking at. Uh, uh, it's not so easy, basically. We are now focused on um, trying to model the Boltzmann diagram. It is a more intuitively way to understand the excitation of such lines. Thank you a lot. You're welcome. So just to wait a little bit, if there are more questions, uh, can you comment, if, do you know if there are X-ray observations also for the other sources that you commented in the literature and if they find the same thing as you did? Uh, I think that uh, previous works uh, targeted uh, uh, known quasars. So yeah, I, I, I guess that uh, maybe there is X-ray observation for such, uh, for such uh, high redshift galaxies, but I'm not sure actually. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So Welcome. Yeah, I so very nice work again, like thank you very much. You're welcome. And if there are no more questions, I would let Paola talk. So. Yeah, so really uh, thanks to Maria Jose, Antonio uh, for very interesting and uh, nice talks and uh, to be <laughs> quite on time. Uh, congratulations. 
for everything and thank to Anna and Chiara for chairing this session. So we have uh, still a couple of uh, colloquia next Tuesday and in two weeks, the last two of this uh, season. Uh, I wish you all the best for your career and to all the uh, attendees for thank you for listening to us and uh, see you next uh, next week and uh, all the best bye bye thank you very much bye thank you bye